How much engine power does it take just to drive down the road at highway speeds? And then, how much additional power might it take to hook up your prized aluminium chitois and tow it all the way to Dingo Piss Creek? And while we're on about things of this nature, what exactly is brake specific fuel consumption and how might you the aspiring beer garden physicist entertain yourself with that endlessly i'm john canogan from autoexpert.com.au and i get new cars cheap for buyers here in australia website for that obviously or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. Okay, got this question from Peter McCallum. I'm confused about how some cars can tow 3.1 tonnes with 157 kilowatts and 500 newton metres, such as Everest Titanium, and others with 204 kilowatts and 588 newton metres can only tow 2.7 tonnes, like Genesis GV80. Can you explain to me what I'm missing? Kind regards. Pete. Okay, so let us address all of that in just a second, but I do want to turn this into a bit of a dialogue and address some things that came up yesterday in my primer on ghetto engineering, okay? Being getting into metalwork but doing it here in your very own fat cave to, I don't know, preserve mental fitness and health and all of that sort of stuff while you're on lockdown principally. There's some cool stuff you can do here. And one of the things that came up was grinders. So let's talk about that. My position has not changed, although plenty of you disagreed with me, in that you should not use gloves when you use a grinder. That's my position on this and you're entitled to your view, I suppose, but I've worked in industry and all the grinders, including all the bench grinders, had big signs on them saying no gloves because gloves are an entrapment hazard. They can feed your hand into the gap between the disc and the guard. And if that happens, it's a real orthopedic surgery challenge. And, you know, I just don't want that. So my position has not changed. And plenty of places have sort of arbitrary safety policies and I guess some of those safety policies say wear gloves and I'd be happy to debate that with any safety officer ever because wearing gloves with grinders is an entanglement and entrapment hazard and it's kind of up to you how you manage safety in your own fat cave but I will not be wearing gloves ever when I touch an angle grinder. And yeah, it's a pain in the ass because if you're welding and you switch to grinding, you're wearing big heavy gloves to weld, you gotta take them off to grab the grinder. And I console myself by still having 10 fingers after 30 something years of touching the tool. So there's that. Uh, plenty of people ask me about these very cool glasses that just boost my vision. They're 1.5s or twos or something, plus 1.5 or two. And I need them to read the scale on uh, rulers and things of that nature, okay? Otherwise, I'd be all sort of Jose Feliciano with the whole metalworking thing, and I don't think that would work very well. Just go to click.com.au, I think it is, but just Google click, and that is such a good, such a slick mechanism. The only thing I'd say is if you're doing a bunch of metalwork and you put them down, the magnet that does the work will just fill up with iron filings and need to be cleaned off from time to time, right? Like all magnetic things. A few of you also said, well, I wear spectacles, so how the hell do I manage eye protection? Because I do, uh, I didn't recommend safety glasses as well. And obviously you can't wear safety glasses and spectacles generally at the same time. So excuse me for rocking the dome here, but I've got a couple of options for you. And the first one, which also includes some decent face protection, it's a little bit, join me on the dark side and together we will rule the galaxy. And I certainly want to don this and walk into the bank currently and demand a bit of money because, hey, wear a mask. This qualifies. <coughs> I think you'd agree. Anyway, you get full face protection and you can wear your specs and you get unimpeded field of view and the specs are not pressed into my face so I can wear these for hours if necessary. But they do tend to fog up because of this gasket on the inside here. Right, so there's not much airflow through goggle type alternatives, which brings me to perhaps a more practical solution, which is not as much Star Wars, but you get full head protection and right down to the bottom of your chin as well. So if a grinding disc does explode, 
your face is protected as well as your eyes and you can flip it out of the way when you don't need it but you have to remember to flip it back down when you're in danger so there's that they're the alternatives for you know eye protection if you wear spectacles and the last question i got was about these flat packed fixture squares which are such a cool welding project so when you put them together you clamp them up and you weld them in there in those little tab and slot holes and you put a few inches of weld in and that gives you some valuable welding practice and you've got a fixture square that you can use to mark things out reliably they come in a couple of different sizes i'm going to try and not burst your eardrums by dropping it here's the smaller of uh, the two i think there's actually four different sizes but the uh, difference between this one and the, the other one is its thickness as opposed to its uh, footprint okay so you can get a thicker version of the big one as well i'll put a link to that in the description sorry i didn't do that in the video yesterday but i couldn't remember where i got them from and those questions from you prompted me to go in search of the emails when i bought those flat packs so i bought four of each the narrower of the big one and the narrower of the small one and i'm just going to keep them in my welding kit because it's going to solve a whole bunch of warping kind of problems when i put frames together i got to get the bandsaw over here and get it up higher because it's just literally a pain in the back to use for some protracted period and the worst thing about it and i've had it for donkey's years the worst thing about it is the stand the stand is hateful but the saw is actually quite good so there's that now the olight sale as well still on until midnight tonight you get 30 percent off my favorite torch which is the olight warrior mini 2 it's an everyday carry for me so useful and utterly reliable and with the best charging system i've ever seen link in the description on that now let's get back to pete's question right because as a thought experiment yeah genesis and everest they're kind of interesting i suppose and you can compare them in various ways but if you've actually got a short list and gv 80s on it and everest is on it there's something has gone seriously wrong with your vehicle selection protocol because they're just such different vehicles okay one's a luxury conveyance and the other one's a derivative of the ford ranger ute and they have done some things to everest in order to try and make it somewhat more civilized but like they've given a coil sprung rear end and all-wheel drive and things of that nature but it's really still in that sort of hardcore all-terrain heavy towing space whereas the genesis is a luxury conveyance and th this thing about the engine outputs as well that needs to be addressed because when you look at the specs and you see the engine numbers what you're really seeing there is the peaks okay so they stick an engine on a dynamometer and they run it absolutely flat to the boards like flat knacker and then they record the peaks of power and torque and the revs that they occur at okay and that's kind of useful for comparing different engines because if you're looking at one engine with 200 kilowatts and one engine with 300 kilowatts as a peak both at 6000 rpm you could infer from that that in the mid rev range like for normal driving the more powerful peak engine is also going to be more powerful at lower revs as well so it's not altogether a dodgy way to compare engines but it's not like how you drive you very rarely outside of a race environment or a drag strip or outside of a really steep hill with a really heavy van so briefly you're not using full throttle all the time against a balancing load so you just don't drive like that and in fact you use very little power to do mundane driving like often just two figures of kilowatts you know 60 70 50 40 30 whatever even at highway speeds often enough okay and the peaks are the peaks are only there for comparison purposes so there's that and towing limitations are nobody ever tells you what the weakest link is like car makers do not tell you the weakest link but they are based on a weakest link type scenario so the weakest link is unlikely to be the power or torque production of the engine but it might be endurance related like it might be the heat capacity of the automatic transmission because in their R&D sort of torture testing of a particular vehicle they might go out and tow a dynamometer they typically tow an electric load on a trailer to simulate a, a big van or something like that in a tow test and then they might notice that above an equivalent simulated weight of 
3.1 tonnes, let's say, at highway speeds, the transmission might start to overheat. And then they go and say, well, you know, 20 years or 15 years in service, worst case scenario, they'll all be going poopy in their trousers, that's unacceptable, we'll have to knock it back a bit. So that's one alternative. Another alternative is things like the tyres, right? Because when you look at the specs, I've got them here, when you look at the specs, right, they're 26540R22s on the Genesis, right? That's a high-performance tyre, meaning high-performance for cornering and braking and things of that nature, but not so much for load carrying, all right? 26550R20s on the Everest Titanium. So when you look at that, you've actually got 25% more sidewall. You've got the same width, and they go up from 40 series to 50 series on the Everest, right? So it's still a pretty low profile tire, but it's actually got 25% more sidewall. And it may be a tire limitation that brings the Genesis down in terms of what you can tow. Or it might be something to do with the suspension setup because they've got luxury in mind and to put springs in that Genesis at the rear that might make it tow a little bit better, a little bit more like the 3.1 tonnes of the Everest, they'd have to sacrifice too much ride quality and then they go and do the maths on how many people are actually going to tow at the maximum capacity of a Genesis anyway. Because i got to tell you, if you turn up in your chitois at the border crossing for the Dingo Piss Creek World Heritage Area, probably not going to be let in in that Genesis. You know, you'll kind of get let in in an Everest, but it's not a Toyota, so you, you won't be getting a campsite up the front near the Golden Billabong or anything. But, you know, it kind of plays out like that. Everest gets in, Genesis not so much, you know. So there are all these kinds of things to consider. It's interesting to me, though, that the Genesis has a payload of 738 kilos, whereas for the Everest Titanium, it's only 623. So I'd love to know exactly what does limit the tow capacity of both of those vehicles, but car makers just never tell you this stuff. My protocol with all of this is try and give yourself 10 to 20% of safety margin at least but also try and keep it so that the van that you're towing is less than the loaded mass of the vehicle doing the towing. So that's everything, right? That's you and your lovely wife and your agreeable children, your beautiful children and all of the crap. And even if you've gone to ARB and said, get started, mate, I'll take one of everything, right? It doesn't matter. Whatever that loaded weight is, right, your van should be equal to or less than that, and then it'll just have less capacity to nudge you off the road. But if you want to drill down into exactly how much power it takes to do this kind of work, to tow a van or just to drive your vehicle down the highway at some sort of respectable highway speed, there's this thing, okay? It's called brake-specific fuel consumption. And if you wrap your brain around that, you can figure all of that out. In fact, just make a few conservative assumptions and this project becomes dead easy like let's do it now so the obvious point to be made here is brake specific fuel consumption like kill me now all of applied science, like, hey, all of science is this club, right? And if you don't learn to speak the language, it's like they don't let you in, okay? Brake specific fuel consumption and its loosely related cousin, brake mean effective pressure. It's like, what? Brake specific fuel consumption means, specific just means in relation to, okay? And brake means power, right? So it's the fuel consumption in relation to the power that's produced. It's kind of normalized for the amount of power. It just means the units are unhelpful as well, like grams per kilowatt hour. But if we do a little algebraic hack with that, it gets easier to understand, okay? It's the grams per hour of fuel, like the mass of fuel that the engine has to burn in an hour per kilowatt that it produces, okay? So that's a bit easier to understand. It's like how much fuel does an engine need to burn to make one kilowatt in an hour? It's that. The typical modern 4x4 diesel engine is ballparking it at about 200 grams of fuel per hour for every kilowatt that comes out of the arse end of the crankshaft. That's kind of how they roll. And when engines get bigger, 
they tend to produce a little bit less. The number gets smaller. It's like 160 or something. Like in a tank or one of those dirty big mining trucks or a, a big truck, okay? The number kind of drops. And then as the engines get smaller, the number increases, right? So that's just how it rolls. It's a relative measure of efficiency because if an engine can be designed that only has to burn 190 grams of fuel in an hour for every kilowatt that it produces, then some mad engineering voodoo has made that other engine with the lower number more efficient, right? So engineers use this kind of thing all the time. They speak the language. They just talk about BMEPs for brake mean effective pressure and BSFCs for brake specific fuel consumption. It just rolls off the tongue and everyone else just watches it like tennis and hopes to get the number of that bus that hit them. So the other thing we're going to need here, right, to make sense of all of this and use it in a meaningful way is Marcus Kraft's tow test. Now, Crafty is a really good 4x4 journo. He works at Cars Guide. I don't often praise motoring journalists, but I've got deep respect for Crafty and his work, so I trust his results here. He did, on the 11th of February last year, he did a tow test. It was a Land Cruiser 200 and a Patrol TI, right? And it was really, so V8 diesel, V8 petrol, and they used a control caravan, a chitois, in this case, a Jayco Silverline, which weighs 2650 kilos, tear weight, which is a nice conservative tow assignment for a vehicle such as that, okay? And what impresses me about that is the results he got are consistent with expectations, okay? 23.5 litres per 100 for the Land Cruiser when it was towing, and 12.6 when it was not. And that makes perfect sense, right? Because more wheels on the deck roughly double the amount of rolling resistance. The caravan's substantially larger, so roughly double the amount of aerodynamic drag. And roughly double the weight because the Land Cruiser weighs in at about 2.75 tonnes. I think it's 2740 if memory serves for a Land Cruiser. So roughly double everything and they got, guess what, roughly double the fuel consumption. Knock me down with a feather. It probably was a little bit under double because you can't go quite as fast when you're towing that big heavy chitois out the back. That makes sense, not if you're conservative. Anyway, they did this 140 kilometer loop on the highway and they also, part of that loop involved some good dirt roads, some unsealed roads and some B roads as well. So that sort of plays into a cogent picture of how this works, right? And to make sense of all of this, we're going to have to make a couple of assumptions, okay? But we're really just going to use the data and crunch the numbers and make BSFC work for us. The BSFC 200 grams per hour per kilowatt, 0.2 of a kilo of fuel per hour for every kilowatt that the engine needs to make to do its job, okay? We're going to work out the kilowatts, in other words. That's the objective here. We need to figure out all the other data we need to work out how many kilowatts it takes to do this tow job, all right? Fuel consumption is 23.5. We know that from Marcus's test. Diesel is about 850 grams or 0.85 of a kilo for every litre, and it varies a little bit, but ballpark, it's that, and hey, we're here in the beer garden, so let's just roll with that. And I'm going to assume that Crafty managed 75 kilometres an hour average speed for this test. And I can't see him doing it any faster because he's a conservative guy, he's towing a big van, and uh, that is not an assignment for the faint hearted, and you wouldn't want to go and drive like uh, a respected motoring journalist, would you? You don't set the lap record with a big fat chitois like that. So maybe he didn't even average 75, okay? But this will give us a. Uh, this will give us a conservative estimate. It'll be, if it's wrong, it's the right way wrong so that it doesn't skew our results and make the power look too low, okay? So if you drive for one hour at 75 kilometres an hour, you drive 75 kilometres, right? Which is three quarters of the amount that the fuel consumption is quoted because this is 23.5 litres for 100 kilometres, okay? So he's going to use, for every 100 kilometres, or for every hour that he drives, sorry, he's going to use three quarters of this amount of fuel, which is 17.6 litres of fuel. And fuel weighs that much, so that's 15 kilos of fuel. It's 14.96, but 
shoot me for rounding up. Okay, and all we need to know there is we've got 15 kilos of fuel, so that's what we burn in an hour. So how many kilowatts come out the arse end of the crankshaft? It's really easy. Just go 15 on point two equals 75 kilowatts. And a Land Cruiser peaks at 200, so we're well under half of the peak power output, right? And even down here, down lower in the rev range, we know that the Land Cruiser makes peak torque of 650 newton metres between these revs, 1600 and 2600, okay? And there's a relationship between torque and power. Power is strictly mathematically joined at the hip to torque, and it works like this. The kilowatts are the newton metres times the RPMs divided by 9549. Okay, and you can work this out from first principles, but you have to convert RPM into radians per second, right? And that's not exactly for the mathematically faint-hearted. You have to understand what a radian is, and that's because these units have to be dimensionless, and revs per minute is not really a dimensionless unit, whereas radians per second are. So once you've done all of that, or you can just plug it into this formula, okay? But 650 Newton meters at 1600 RPM, flat knacker, is 109 kilowatts, okay? And flat knacker at 2600, it's 177 kilowatts. And it just goes up on a straight line between 109 and 177 at 1600 RPM and 2600 RPM, right? And then when you get up to 3600 RPM, it's 200, so it's kind of rounding off a little bit between there and there, but it's still sort of climbing up the mountain, right? The mountain's just not getting real steep up the top here, okay? And that stands to reason. But even at 1600, there's still enough power available with a big fat right welly application. You're only, well, you're not even using three quarters of the power that's hypothetically available at 1600 RPM to do this average sort of driving with a big fat van at 75 kilometers an hour, all right? And in practice, because a gearbox, like a transmission in a car is really just, it's like a money exchange and the commodities being exchanged are torque and revs. You can have more torque or you can have more revs, but you can't have both coming out the arse end, okay? So at high speed, for example, you've got lots of revs coming out driving the wheels, but you don't have as much torque, okay? So it's really just this exchange mechanism. And what happens in practice at 1600 RPM, like let's say you're going downhill with your chitois and then you might be doing, I don't know, 75, 80 k's an hour. You might have got up to 90, 95 on the way down. Then you get on the flat and you start going slightly uphill. So you give it a bit more welly and the transmission on the way down has probably shifted up and you're probably doing quite low revs. And then as the demand from the driver increases, because the accelerator is really a demand system, then the transmission goes, ah, need a bit more torque, right? So it changes back. Right? You get more revs and therefore you've got more power available, hypothetically, depending on the position of the accelerator. And that means you don't have to go flat to the boards because all of a sudden, if let's say you change back a couple of gears and you go from 1600 to 2600, for any throttle position, you're getting sort of a 70% increase in power, right? Because the revs have come up. That just makes perfect sense, okay? so. It doesn't take that much power to drive a van anywhere, right? It really doesn't. It's a small amount of power. And that's why the power output of the engine is hardly ever the limiting factor when it comes to a particular vehicle's towing capability. And we're never going to drill down into the weakest link of every vehicle because manufacturers won't tell us. But I'll guarantee with just about every vehicle that's capable of some sort of heavy tow capacity, it's not power output that is holding you back.